So the plan for today is that the first half of class is just going to be starting to talk about property and property in cyberspace and intellectual property. And then the second half is going to be the much more practical how on earth do you write a philosophy paper. Um, I don't think we're going to talk about property for more than like 45 minutes today, maybe an hour. And then most of the class will be the how on earth do you write a philosophy paper also known as what's the best way to get bless you. What's the best bless you get? What's the best way to get an A in this class? So um that's what the second half will be. And uh, I'm gonna give a bit more time to how to write a paper than I have in semesters past and hopefully it'll be helpful. And then next week we'll next week? Or is it the week after? I think next week we'll talk more about uh, how to write papers. And then a couple weeks after that, you'll have your first paper due. So next Friday, uh, for an assignment, you have to turn in to me uh, in class a copy of your thesis and uh, like basically the first paragraph of what your first paper will be. It's only going to be a few sentences, like anywhere between, like say, three and eight sentences. And as long as you turn something in and it's responding to one of the paper prompts, you will get a pass on this assignment. Uh, if you basically the only way you fail this assignment is if you don't turn it in, or what you turn in is you know utterly unrelated to the class. Like if you just fell asleep on your keyboard and it came out as the letter A a thousand times, you wouldn't pass. But other than that, like it's mostly just to ease in. So you want to have it typed or does it matter? Ah, uh, I really don't care. Also, though, bring in two copies. Um, so probably you're going to want to type it. Uh, because one of them you're going to give to me, and the other one we are going to spend like half of class. You can either, uh, if you are at all shy or don't like to share your work with people until you're ready, you can self-review. And if you uh, are comfortable sharing with someone, you'll peer review, and you're basically going to bring them in, hand them to somebody else, and then we're going to talk about like, what is a thesis supposed to look like? Does yours meet this standard? Moving on to the next section, how are you going to turn this one paragraph into an entire paper? So bring that stuff in for next class, uh, and I will send an email about that as well. But um, that's business stuff. Anyway, everyone on board? Business? We good? All right. Uh, I should probably take this out. So I've already said what the first half of class today is going to be about. What is it? Property, yeah. Property. So, property and tech. So, uh, this kind of ties into last time. Last time we were talking about crime, and there's one particular type of crime in cyberspace, which is, I think, without a doubt, the most common type of illegal activity that takes place on the internet. So, what is the most common type of illegal activity that takes place on the internet? Yeah, piracy. Any sort of taking of movies, music, books, anything which you legally should have paid for and acquiring it for free. That is without doubt the most common type of technically a crime that takes place on the internet. Pardon? I mean like take one, two, three movies for instance. Like yeah. the owner literally like not only buys those movies off of the like, I don't know, like buys them from Best Buy or like Blockbuster, and also like record it secretly with the hidden cameras. Yeah, exactly. Theater, just and then they, it just uploaded and then like rips it from the DVDs. Yeah, because so legally, the only way you're supposed to get a copy of a movie is you buy it from somebody who made it, or you buy it from somebody who bought it from somebody who made it. You aren't legally supposed to just, you know, get a copy of a movie for free. You're allowed to show your friend a copy if they come to your house. You're allowed to give them the physical disc if anyone watches movies on discs. <laughs> but you're not supposed to take a copy, like a disc, copy the disc, and then give it to everyone you know for free. Technically, that's illegal. Also, if you download something from the internet for free, also illegal. This is the most common sort of cybercrime, and yet everybody does it. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that every single one of you at some point has illegally obtained a copyrighted piece of material. Uh, yeah. 
That's just the way the world is. Why is it? Like, if I were to go to 100 years ago, none of you would have done, have done this. None of you would have illegally obtained copies of things. What's the fundamental difference? Why is it now that all of us commit piracy and robbery all the time? Popularity. Popularity is part of it, but it's not just that it's popular. What's the other key? It's a thing that's not easy. So much easier. It's uh -huh. the year, imagine it's a thousand years ago and your friend has a book, and you really want a copy of that book, what would you have to do? Make it to the scribe. Google. Yeah. A thousand years ago. No, 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 you just buy it, you just buy it. A thousand years ago, who would you buy it from? You have to get the find the scribe. Okay. Yeah, you literally have to, you have two options. One, you copy it yourself, or two, you pay somebody else to copy it by hand. Like, there were not typewriters, there were not printing presses, you literally had to copy it. Monks in the Middle Ages spent most of their time sitting in candlelit rooms, literally copying the Bible by hand so that more people would have copies of the Bible. Like, that's literally how you got copies. Which also explains why there are so many mistranslations and, like, poorly... Like, if you actually go to, like, copies of a book that was copied a thousand years ago, they all have slightly different writings because some monk made a mistake because if you're writing, like think about how fat the Bible is. It is not a small book. Imagine copying it by hand you for years and years. Like, pocket version is this. Yeah, the pocket version weighs like two pounds. It's this big. And like imagine having to copy it and get it exactly right. Nowadays, if you want a copy of the Bible, what do you do? Control C, Control V. Yeah, you go to the internet, you download something, then you hit Control C, Control V. It's the difference between this and however long it would take you to literally write a copy of the Bible. Like, I mean, it would take a really long time. It would take, like, weeks to copy word for word an entire novel right. or Bible or anything. Now, split second. And you, like, it used to be that if you wanted to get a book, you really needed to want it. Now you might just download it, see if it's something you want to read, and then put it aside. Like, it's just a totally different game. And so this is the major difference, is it's now so much easier, easier to copy and exchange. Extract. I say extract rather than exchange. No, no, no. I mean exchange in terms of you give it to somebody else. Uh, like, wh if I have a, a book and it's a digital copy, I can get it to you all in a split second. Like, we're talking speed of light here. It used to be, if you want to send your grandma something, you have to mail it. And before there was mailing, you would have had to physically bring it to her. So this is the major difference, is it's so, 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 so much easier. So, like, hypothetically speaking, like, if you were to, like, get, like, the PDF of, you know, the reading that, you know, you weren't supposed to send to the class, you know, to read. To yeah, exactly. If you were to, in theory, have a professor who, in theory, gave you a copy of an in-theory textbook, uh via your in theory email, that's technically illegal, and yet I'm sure that you have had such hypothetical professors at some point in your time in college or high school, or you get it from a friend. So, here's the question then. Here's this thing which happens all the time, everybody does it, and yet it's technically illegal. Why is it illegal? Why was it ever illegal? And why should it continue to be illegal, or should it be? And that's really what we're going to be talking about. Because what we're talking about here are cases of intele oh, I don't need to there. intellectual property uh, theft. So what we're going to talk about this class is intellectual t property is a type of what? Yeah, it's a type of property. Intellectual property is a specific type of property. And so what we're going to look at is why on earth do we care about property? Why do we care about intellectual property? And why did we start having laws like we do today to protect intellectual property? And then next class, what we're going to talk about is just the ways in which these laws, which we've had, like intellectual property law as it exists in the United States has been around since the Constitution at the very latest. Like we have had this in its current form for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the question is, well, you know, Ben Franklin had intellectual property, but he didn't have the internet. So do we need Ben Franklin's laws to change? Do we need to change what we think about this? And why is it that now that 
technology exists, we need different laws that apply much more nicely. So that's going to be next time. This time it's just, why do we care about property in the first place? Why don't we just throw out intellectual property laws and say piracy is allowed for everyone? Like, if you can get a digital copy of it, you're fine. And that's going to be the question. Of why don't we want that? And also, like, in 2007, uh, if any of you guys know what the Pirate Bay is, or kick ass Taurus, mm -hmm. like, they have, like, released it, meaning they have made a debut, and then, like, that's another way to get not only movies, but also video games and music. And yeah, the ways in which you can get anything digital illegally or for free, it's just off, the, like, if it exists, in a digital form, you can get it. You want to get a digital, like a pirated version of uh, Windows, you can get it. You want any video game, you can get it. Any book, any program, any code, if you want to get anything, it, like you can get it. Yeah, uh, first of all, I do have Pirate Bear on my Mac, but, uh, um, but no, I was going to say to answer your question, that I think that um, it's just about the integrity about having property, like, you know, like I think that has to do with the most of it. Like, not, I mean, yeah, because you don't want people that steal it, yeah, but I think it just has to do with the integrity of it, like, people are expecting to put this out and to, for the consumer to want it yeah. in, the, in the proper way that they, you know, no, no pun intended, yeah. but uh, it's like, and, and, and it's like, and they were, when they give you these goods, they want to be, like, they want that type of reciprocation. And this is exactly what we're going to be talking about, is it seems like at the core of why intellectual property is a thing, is because if you put in the effort to think of something or write something, the idea is that you should somehow be rewarded for it. And not only that, a world in which people are rewarded for it is a better world than one in which they aren't. And so that's the core idea, and we're going to get there uh, in a little, in like 15 to 20 minutes. But let's just start off with, we said, uh, we're going to talk more generally about like what is property, why is intellectual property different from other sorts, and then how do the same considerations apply? So this is, again, more of that philosophy stuff. So if on the one side we have intellectual property, which we'll talk about in a minute, what other type of property is there? If it's not intellectual property, I mean, there's not a good term. I don't think the book has one. Physical property. Yeah, physical property, or just like physical property. I don't need that because it's written like that. Okay, so physical. So what are some examples of physical property that you personally have? Everything, land, time. Yeah, so if like you own a house, assets. that is your property. If you own, uh, everyone lift up something which is their property right now. Yep, if you're lifting up something you own and are not borrowing from the school or something like that, that is your property. Property is just basically the stuff which is yours. Um, but there's a special thing with with uh, physical property, where it's not just that it is in your possession right now. What's the difference? So like right now, um, we're all breathing the air in this room. And when we breathe it in, it goes into our lungs. But we don't think of the air as our property, even though like the air is literally inside of you and then it comes out of you. Like what is the difference between say your phone and the air that goes into your lungs? What is the major difference here? Um, I think like, in, like just, because, like we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, when you're talking about like security, you know, you were talking about how like what makes it secure is because of how nobody else can uh, in, in to influence the in, uh, integrity of that thing. So it's like for the property, it's like nobody can change how it's yours. Whereas like the air can be influenced to be. That's exactly it. It's that in the case of property. It's that it's not just that something you're interacting with. It's that you have control over how it's interacted with, who else can interact with it, and what they can do with it. So with property, it's stuff that you have control over, and not just in the physical sense. It's stuff you have a right to control. So. Do you remember back when we talked about privacy, we differentiated between natural privacy, which was times in which you're just alone, but um, even though you're alone, it's not like you have any right to be there, and if anyone comes upon you, it's not like they're doing something wrong, it's just you happen to be private. 
And then we said on the other side there was normative privacy, which is the sort of privacy that you should have and that you deserve. Well, property is kind of like that, it has a normative sense to it. It's not just that it's yours, it's that in some sense it should be yours. And anyone else who takes it without your permission or breaks it is doing something wrong and should be punished. And that's the fundamental idea with what property is. Is it the stuff you have a right to control and you can control what other people do with it and why they do those things. So, so think about your phone. What are you allowed to do with your phone? Yeah. Well, actually, the phone is tough because then there's like some rules because it's also like you aren't allowed to fiddle around in the operating system. But let's say your shoes. That's a more straightforward one. What are you allowed to do with your shoes right now? Wear them. You're allowed to wear them. If you wanted to set your shoes on fire for no good reason, could you do it? Yeah, yeah you could. Well, I was probably mad at John Jay, but yeah, you probably couldn't do it at John Jay. But if you went home and got like a trash, a metal trash can, and threw your shoes in, you could burn them. You'd be allowed to. No, no one would show up at your door and yell at you. <laughs> now, if I were to sneak up on you, rip your shoes off your person, run away with them, and then send you a video of me burning them, it's a very different matter. Uh huh. The difference is, your shoes are your shoes, and you're allowed to do with them what you want. My shoes are my shoes. I could burn my shoe. Like no one would care if I burned this, uh, except then I'd have one. It'd be really awkward to walk around in one shoe all day. Um, but outside, of, like you are allowed. You have complete control over what you want to do. And that's the major idea behind property, is that it is something which you own and are allowed to do just about anything you want, provided that you don't then use it to do other negative things. But, yeah. I, just, I just want to uh, confirm your uh, words, but we're just as in stuff you have right to control. I was thinking about Kantian autonomy and the, uh, and the phrase that people are ending up in of themselves as not resourced. Yeah, and that's a really great point. So think back to Kant and how he said that things, um, to treat another person morally is to treat them as an end in themselves, not simply as a means. Well, it, property is stuff that you are allowed to treat simply as a means and nobody cares about it. Um, so part of the reason why like, we think of slavery as wrong is when you have a slave, you are treating them simply as a means, i.e. you're treating them as your property. But if you're treating, and this is why, um, yeah, so this is the same idea of if you're treating someone as an autonomous agent where they have a right to things, then you have to respect their property as part, or like things they own and have a right over, and you cannot take control of them as your property. But your property is perfectly fine. It is can be used as a means to anything you want. Um, did I construe your point well enough? Okay, just making sure I didn't, I didn't rudely ignore you. All right, so yeah. All right, why do we care about physical property? Why is it, and I kind of suggested this already, why is it that we think like, this is my water bottle. It is mine, I'm allowed to do with it what I want. Why should I have that right? What is it about my water bottle? Why is it something that we want in the world? What is it that makes property worthwhile? Because it would be possible, name something that doesn't have property. Parts of the world that don't have property. Pardon? Yeah, water doesn't have property. Or like, to go with a living example. Communist society. Yeah, so a communist society is one where there's no property. Um, society. Although, yeah, so in a communist society, the idea is that no one has private ownership. Everything is owned by the state, which is then given to everybody. Everybody gets an equal share. Um, so that's the idea, is instead of having like the incredibly wealthy and the incredibly poor, everyone's on an equal playing field. Some other things that don't have property. Well, not a thing, but uh, uh, a particular area, but homeless people. Yeah, homeless people don't have any property. They don't have anything they have control over. Um, but you did. Political organization. And here's, a, well, I actually don't know. Political organizations, any sort of company or political organization is tough because you can have ownership owned by a private company under a board of directors, and I don't want to get into the legal battles and complications right now, so I'm going to say that it's complicated on that one. But another one that I can think of is like a very straightforward case, a squirrel. A squirrel does not have like property. It can hold a nut, and it can eat the nut, but it's not like it has property. If another squirrel comes along and punches the first squirrel and takes its nut, 
It's like kind of like, haha, that was cute, that squirrel stole that other squirrel's nut. But it's not like in any way the squirrel who's stolen the nut has done anything wrong. It's just like been a squirrel and it's taken the nut away. I saw a squirrel yesterday that didn't have a tail. It was a very confused bunny rabbit. Um, it was quite cute, but uh, and I also kind of felt bad. I didn't know if like without its tail it couldn't climb as well or anything. But anyway, uh, so yeah, so anything that, the difference between, if you have a bag of nuts and I steal your bag of nuts, I've done something wrong. If a squirrel has like a little pile of nuts and another squirrel comes along and takes it, it hasn't violated its property or anything like that. It's taken them. And so this is a real difference. Like property is something, it's not just that you have in your possession, it's that you have a right to have in your possession. And so what is it, why do we want to have property? Because it would be possible to have a society or to live like squirrels <laughs> where the only thing that's yours is what you're physically holding on to at this time. I guess maybe what you're trying to emphasize is like the, uh, the, uh, the right part is like because of the value. Yeah. So of the property. So here's the idea is there's a sense in which we value our property and it has mm -hmm. worth to us and we think that we should have worth to it. But it's not like it intrinsically, by its very nature, has to be the sort of thing which can be owned. Yeah. So why is it that we as a because society... Because like a golden acorn. Yeah. Then it would probably be valuable. But also with a golden acorn, like, um, why even though is gold valuable? So here's That's the... That's what I was going to say. Like, if it was like a golden acorn, it might not mean anything to, like, say, you know, to, like, somebody who doesn't collect gold, but say if it was like... Your grandmother gave you the or the grand the squirrel's grandmother gave him that on an acorn and he was using it and, and it meant something to him and he probably would want or, or she would want that value. Yeah, so here's the is why is it? Like so we have this idea of if it's if it's given to you, like physically, if I were to hand you something, uh, and now it is yours, why is it so imagine one with a squirrel. Like when a squirrel is holding an acorn, it is in some sense that squirrel's acorn. But it's not that squirrel's acorn in the same sense that if I gave you a golden acorn made of pure gold that was this big, like if I gave that to you, it would be yours in a different sense than it's the squirrel's. There's something about it, and what's the difference? We as a society decided we have this stuff property. And when it's yours in this special sense, you have control and a right to control it. So why is it that we live in a society where this is a thing? Because you can imagine, like, you could just say, everything is everybody's. Nobody has personal property. If anything gets quote unquote stolen from you, well then it's just not yours anymore. You can't go to the cops, they don't care. You can't fight someone for it, they don't care. There's no rights or anything. It's just whatever is currently in your possession is yours, and what's not in your possession is everybody's. So why is it that we have a society in which we have cops who, if you get your stuff stolen, will try to find it for you? What is the underlying reason that we want property, or why we want it in the first place? Well, was that a hand? Yes, I was just uh, uh, thinking about uh, end endless chain of theft that would, that would take place, and it would, it would then make sense to, to exist for the purpose of having, then for the purpose of being. Yeah, and uh, I think that's a really nice way of putting it. So basically, there's two reasons. One is, what is... What do our friends the utilitarians say in general? Think back. What does the utilitarian believe? Promote the most. Promote yeah, it's, it's the idea is you do things that create the most happiness for the biggest number of people, like just the most happiness in the world. And the utilitarian is going to say that a, a society in which you have personal property is a society in which people on the whole are better off. If you look at the amount of pleasure and happiness that are created in a world in which you have personal property, then you end up with a lot happier people. And why is that? Well, imagine what would happen if you didn't live in a world with personal property. So imagine in this world, if your things are taken out of your house, uh, the cops are not going to help you find it. If somebody breaks into your house, it's not trespassing because that house isn't yours. It just happens to be where you are at this moment. Why is this a society that you wouldn't want to live in as much as the way we have it now? Uh, I, won't, I don't know what thinking in utilitarian terms as in, as in contractually terms. As in, you would not be able to accomplish anything because everyone would be taking your property away from you and you would be, in turn, be uh, 
uh, most ways to sabotage their product. Yeah. So here's the idea. How many of you leave valuable things at home? Raise your hand right now if there's something in your house that you want to be there when you get home. So why do you feel comfortable leaving it in your house? Because there is a possibility that you might lose it. But why? So right now, you're yeah, so if you take it with you, you might lose it. It's a possibility. Yeah, so why, though, do you feel safe leaving it at home? Yeah, nobody's going into your house. Because if somebody goes into your house, what's going to happen to them? They might get arrested. So here we have a society where if you've worked, so how, uh, give me an example of something that you have at home right now that you value and you like and you don't want anyone else to take and you're happy it's going to be there when you get home. No. Okay, your passport. Yeah, your passport. That is valuable. What did it take for you to get your passport? Yeah, it, depending on who you are and what your background is, it took anywhere between being, happened to being born in the United States and, or whichever country it was, and then doing like some paperwork and some other things, all the way down to having to live somewhere and prove citizenship and everything else and a lot of work and taking a test and all this other. So depending on who you are, it involves a whole lot of time and effort. Imagine that 